Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, so we're going to we're going to begin this study. Uh, the sermon. I always get a little bit nervous when I do sermons. I do these studies every day, but uh, when I do a sermon, for some reason, I get a bit nervous. But uh, maybe that's a good thing. But uh, before we begin, can we invite the Holy Spirit to be our instructor and guide? Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. Um, for some people, it's passed already, but the blessings of fellowship we can experience now through thy spirit. And we know, Lord, that you are teaching us that the, the trials that we have faced or the experiences in this movement have been given that we may develop a Christ-like character so that we can be prepared for the crisis ahead. And so we ask, Lord, that the things that we study here today and in our personal study will draw us closer to you and to one another, that we may accomplish the work that you've given us to do on this earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, hello, everyone, again. And um, so we uh, are supposed to be doing a sermon it's it's a little bit difficult doing sermon studies are easier. I'm not sure why. So we're going to have to try to make this more of a study than a sermon. Last time I, I treated it more, more like a sermon. I need to treat it more like a study. But we do want something that is, um, you know, a message from God. We're not going to be guessing and and trying to figure things out that we don't understand, like we do in our morning studies. But this is something that uh, a presentation that I presented. On January 23rd, uh, 2016 at Warburg Church, and it was part two of a series on love. The first one, um, part one of that series um, was uh, okay, somebody put the microphone on. So make sure your microphones are off. I don't know whose microphone's on, but I'm getting a bit of noise. Okay, there, muted someone. Um, so the first one was called uh, Love Part One, The Divine Gift, and that's basically what I presented last Sabbath. And in that presentation, uh, the main thing that I was trying to illustrate, whether I did it clearly or not, was that, um, that God is different than us that his love is not like human love and that his uh, solution to the sin problem is completely different than our solution. And everything that God does is out of love. The whole way that he has worked and operated, even the difficulties and trials that we face come from God's love. That is, he is seeking to draw us to him, that we are he wants to yoke up with us so that we can learn of him, of learn of his, his love and his mercy and his justice. So God never acts arbitrarily. Everything he does is purposeful and comes from his character, which is a character of love. Now, this one, Love Part 2, is called entitled The Law of Liberty. And... Um, we're, we're going to look at this passage here in James chapter one, but it's really a study of the three angels messages or the everlasting gospel. And so hopefully, you know, as we go through this study, um, we can see clearly uh, what love is and how it's actively uh, worked out in our lives through this three step testing prophetic message that we call the everlasting gospel. So we're going to read the scripture here. This is James chapter one, uh, verses 19 to 27. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Um, <clears throat> Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, or superfluity of naughtiness, 
and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's the scripture reading and we want to keep this in mind. So we know James is talking about how uh, faith is not something where we just trust that God's going to do everything for us apart from cooperation with him. But it's trusting that God can do everything for us as we cooperate with him. That there is that when Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. There we are seeing that cooperation, that love, that God's love draws us into a relationship with him that changes us. And that's the whole purpose of, of God's love. He wants us to be like him in character so that he can fellowship with us. <clears throat> so we need to be changed into his image so that we can demonstrate that love to the world. Um, in John chapter 3, uh, verse 16 to 21, we go there. Of course, I've read these verses before. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believeth, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought of God. So here we see the two classes, which is part of the everlasting gospel. <clears throat> so one thing we see here is that God has revealed himself to a world that's steeped in sin, and the work of salvation is the reclamation from sin. God is seeking to save all. Now, are all going to be saved? No. No. So some will not respond to the light. And this is called the mystery of iniquity. That some respond to this light. That Christ's character can be revealed in humanity is called the mystery of godliness. So Jesus is the light of the world, but he says also that ye are the light of the world. In uh, we look here in John chapter eight, uh, verse twelve. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, "I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have." the light of life. And we see this in the next chapter where Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> in Matthew 5, 
Hopefully I'm not moving too fast for people to think about these things. Uh, Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And he giveth light unto all that are in the house. Um, And then he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So we know that the reason that we are the light of the world, that Christ wants us to be the light of the world, is not for our own glory, but for the glory of the Father. So it's a fairly simple idea. Christ is the light. He comes to those that are in darkness. He he gives them the light of life. Right? We can have the light of life. And as we have that light of life, we then are to be the light of the world. You know, Christ was the light of the world, he says, as long as he was in the world. But now he's not in the world. He has us to reveal his character. Now, going back to James chapter 1, when we talk about the law of liberty, because here we're talking about the truth, the light, light and darkness, truth and error, uh, righteousness and sin. And when we talk about the law, we know that the law is referred to as the law of liberty. It's not a law of bondage. And we had, um, if we read here in verse 23 and 24 of James chapter one again, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Or mirror, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But is if light comes to us, and we reject that light, we reject what we see, um, we will go into darkness. Now the question is, why is the law called the perfect law of liberty? By by James here, because many people see it as a yoke of bondage. So why does he refer to as the law? Is he talking about the same law, the Ten Commandments, when he talks about the law of liberty? Is he talking about some different law than the Ten Commandments? I don't well, think commandments, so. The commandments are a law of liberty. Okay. So James, so James called it the royal law as well. Yeah. So if we look at Second Corinthians, and I've done this study many times in different different studies that we've done, um, looking at comparing what James says and what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul's going to talk about the giving of the law um, when Moses put a veil over his face. right? And he put a veil over his face because God's glory was shining upon him and the people did not want to behold that glory. He never knew that his face shone. Right. Until people told him that he did. Um, And so we know that this this is the character of God that was revealed to him. Now, is this the first time or the second time that he receives the commandments that he puts the veil over his face? Does anybody know the answer to that? Uh, I believe it's the second time. Yeah, okay. And and so why is it the second time? Well, the first time he when he came down, he uh he said whoever's on the Lord's side come here and mm-hmm. yeah. And they ended up killing the other ones. And there's no veil on his face there. Yeah, th- yeah, there's no veil there. But wh- why is the second time that his face shone? I give maybe people assurance. The second tablets are just as important. Okay, so if we remember what happens the second time, he's going to want God to reveal his his glory. Glory, yeah. He's okay. going to hold in the cliff to the in the cliff. Yeah. So he's going to and and God's going to declare his glory. The Lord God, merciful, faithful. 
I can't remember all the things he says, but he declares his glory. And 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 Moses really doesn't actually look. He, he sort of bows down. But God revealed his glory, which is his character. And so when he comes down from the mountain the second time. From seeing God, he now has his face shining. Right. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. We sometimes refer it as to the Mar Mara vision. Right. That is uh, the looking glass vision. Right. We're familiar with that. Right. Right. So so this idea of the looking glass vision, you can see why here. Paul is going to talk about uh, a mirror. Right. Just as James does. So. So Moses has looked into this mirror and his face is shining with the glory of God. Now. This is a passage uh, that often is mis, misused uh, by Christians who are opposed to God's law, right? Opposed to the Ten Commandments. Whenever they're, they use it whenever they're attacking Seventh day Adventists regarding, you know, the Old Covenant, right? That's, that's the Old Covenant. And so they will use that in that sense. Um, so he starts in verse six, who also hath made us able ministers of the new testament or the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So when we think about the letter, that's what's written. The spirit is what's behind it. That's the principle of something. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. So this is not talking about the book of the law. It's talking about the Ten Commandments was glorious. And it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which was to be done away. Now, it says which glory was to be done away. And it's not clear if that's exactly what was to be done away, because it could be referring back to uh, to the old covenant, the promises that were made. Uh, by ancient Israel, but we know that his glory that the, of his face is going to fade away. So it could refer to that. How shall the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? So we know that the giving of the Ten Commandments uh, was glorious. But it's also called the ministration of death. And then we have in contrast the ministration of the spirit. It's going to be more glorious. That's He's saying this in a rhetorical sent question. You know, how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So we have these covenants, the new covenant, and the old covenant. The new covenant is, um, it's also the, 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 uh, the new, the covenant of the spirit, right? It is not of the letter. So, so we need to understand what he's talking about here. <clears throat> um, and he says, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. So compared to the glory of the ministration of the spirit, or the ministration of righteousness. The old covenant, that ministration of condemnation, really has no glory, just in comparison. For that which was done away was glorious. Right? Much more that remain that which remaineth is glorious. Now, what was done away? It could be referring to um, the glory on Moses' face. Uh, but it could also refer to the old covenant. So something is done away. Uh, it was glorious. And I'm saying that's the ministration of condemnation is done away. Much more that remaineth is glorious. That's the ministration of righteousness. Because condemnation is going to end. Righteousness is going to continue. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now, I'm not sure if I would say that Paul uses great plainness of speech because sometimes he's hard to be understood. 
But what he's saying is not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So again, it's not clear whether he's talking about the glory that's shining from Moses' face that's abolished or the covenant. Now, in some ways, we can say that they're the same. That That is the glory on Moses' face. That character of God that's seen. Um, that that's going to fade away. It's replaced by something else. But it says that they couldn't look on that which was going to fade away. They couldn't look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now, the other option here is that we know that the veil is done away, but they put the veil here is done away, right? You can see it's in italics. Now, is it that the veil is done away? It's it's not clear. So this plainness of speech here isn't clear because it says the vain, same veil is untaken away. So that means they have this veil over their minds. But what is done away in Christ? And I would still say that this is uh, the ministration of condemnation, not so much the veil, even though in some ways they are attached, right? Because the veil is something that blinds their minds. But what's done away is this ministration of condemnation. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart. Now he's going to say, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. But notice we have taken away and done away. So we could say, well, the reason why they put veil there is because we know the tail is ta- uh, the veil is going to be taken away. But done away and taken away are two different things, are they not? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so I think that they're connected, but I don't think I would put it as straight as that. Um, now, just dealing with here, I'm just going to look at the Greek. Okay, so if we look at these these words here um, with the Greek numbers there, uh, we're going to see some of these words, um, the end of that which is abolished. Uh, that means to render entirely idle, literally or figuratively, abolish, cease, cumber, right? The veil that is done away, you're going to see it's the same word, right? So we got this word abolished, 2673, that's the same word. Um, And then it says uh, taken away is a different word. So it doesn't mean abolished, it just means remove all around. That is unveil, right? So you can see that they're not, not the same words. So there's something that's done away. And there's or abolished. And there's another thing that's taken away, which is the veil. So I wouldn't um, I wouldn't put them as the same thing. Right. So I would say that there's something different. If Paul wanted to say them, they were the same thing. He would have used uh, those words. Right. He would use the same word. But he's using a different. Word. OK, I hope that's clear. So there's something that is done away. There's something that is abolished. And that's that's the glory of this ministration of condemnation. It is glorious. And it's written and engraven on stones. It's the Ten Commandments. But it's not that the Ten Commandments are done. It has to do with something connected to them. Right. And then we're going to see that there's something that has to be taken out of the way. That is a veil. Now, do people have a veil upon their heart that does not allow them to see the gospel? Well, yeah, I would have to say yes. Okay. So what is that veil? What is it that makes the children of Israel not want to behold the glory shining from Moses' face? Uh, self-centeredness. Okay. Um, well, we're all self-centered. 
even if we respond to the light, we're self-centered because God is going to save us uh, from ourselves and we are self-centered by nature. Um, but would it be an apprehension or misapprehension of God's character? That is, when light comes to those that are in darkness, the darkness that they have is a darkness of not knowing God, not knowing who he is. We're sinners. We don't want to approach God. We don't want him to see what we're like. We don't know that he's our loving father. Right. We see him as the hanging judge. Right. Uh, most do. Yeah. Well, I think in some ways, many of us do, even if we intellectually express that we don't, we act as if we do. That is, if we knew God, we would respond differently to him. So we can say, men oh, love God the darkness. Love. Yeah. But we have this dark. Men, lo men love the darkness so that they would not come to the light, lest their deeds would be exposed. That's why we can't see it. Right. Exactly. So here, this veil has to do with God's character, an understanding of God's character, a misapprehension of God's character. Now, Christ came to reveal, right, and, and that's why the veil is done away in Christ. In this, this sense, we would say, the, um, or the veil is taken away in Christ. Here it says the veil is done away. I'm saying it's not the veil in verse 14. What's done away is this ministration of condemnation is done away. But the veil has to be taken out of the way in order for us to see this. So in verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. No, liberty is freedom. Freedom from what? Well, if we look at the law of liberty in James, because he's talking about the law there, we can see that this must be the same thing. It's not just that there is liberty, but there is the law of liberty. That is when we are in obedience with God's commandments, we are free. Now, I asked my children one time, um, and they were younger, but they're still teenagers, and I asked them how they felt about all the rules that they had to obey being my children. And they didn't realize, they said, that there was any rules. Now, it's not because they were wild and disobedient. In fact, you know, one of them, my son James, is probably the most obedient child you could ever imagine having. Um, very obedient, very much seeking to please, you know, his father, right? Um, but never feeling, at least at that time, that he was under any sort of yoke of bondage. Feeling at liberty because... How he was being treated allowed him to to feel free, even though in a sense he he lived a life of restrictions, all kinds of things that my kids could not do. They just didn't realize that they couldn't do them. Right. So if we obey God, if we're in obedience with God, we don't feel under bondage. We feel free. It's only when we transgress God's law that we feel in bondage because we're in bondage to sin you can't be in bondage to obedience now then paul finishes this off he says but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the mirror of the glory in a glass a mirror the glory of the lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord what we need to see is we need a revelation of Christ. We need to see his character. We need to respond to that light that he has given us. And he will change us. Now, that process of changing us from glory to glory, this progression, is not something that is, um, it's not this easy path. We have to go through many, many trials 
to see actually our true spiritual condition, to have a revelation of Christ, to have the mar- mara vision, the looking glass vision. That doesn't just come in a casual manner. It comes through deep trial. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that's clear, that, that part of the study. Deep trials, deep repentance. Yeah. So when we look at this, um, the solution that God has to the problem, to the sin problem, because that's what we talked about. God wants to write our his law upon the fleshy tables of the heart, not on tables of stone. Right? So just asking some questions when we read, uh, uh, Second Corinthians uh, chapter 3 verse 8 to 11 how shall the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious for the minute if the ministration of condemnation be glory much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory for even that which was made glorious had no glories in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth uh, actually I wanted to go to verse 7 that's the one I want But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Right. So we know that the ministration of death is written and engraven in stones. Um, That's the Ten Commandments. So we know that this is the law that's being referred to is the Ten Commandments. And. um and it reveals God's character. So that's why it's glorious. Without, without revealing God's character, it couldn't have any glory. Now, what can the ministration, what can the law written and engraven on stones not do? So if we look at the Ten Commandments, as, what can they not do? It can't change the heart. Only well, Christ can change the heart. Well, it can't change the heart, but it also cannot show a unrighteous person as righteous. So I, bet it, I said it can't, yeah. Yeah, it can't, it can't reveal you and I as righteous. It can only show that we are sinners, right? Because it's written and engraven on stones. All it stands is as a testimony against who we are, against our characters, against our actions, against our thoughts. It can only condemn us. That's why it's the ministration of condemnation because that's all it can do it can only show that we have not met this standard of righteousness and also it can't do anything to change us right it can show us what we are like but it it can't change us in and of itself so we need something we need a revelation of christ's character So we need to understand it is a law of liberty. And if we can remove that veil, that misperception, misapprehension of God's character, then we can look at the law differently. Instead of it looking at it as thou should not or do not do this, we can look at it as God's promises to us. You will not. You know, you will not have other gods before me. You will not bow down to a graven image. Right. You will not take my name in vain and you will remember my sabbath right you will you know honor your father and mother and all these other things i can't remember i know i should be able to quote off all the ten commandments in order but the point is um all of those things in the law those things need to be written in our hearts but that can only happen when we understand God's character, when we have a vision of Christ. And we know that there's these these two ministrations then, the ministration of condemnation and the ministration of righteousness. So the problem is not God's law. The problem that we have, the reason why we're under condemnation, because God's law is supposed to show us that we're sinners. But the reason that we aren't following God's law is because we don't know God. So we have to look 
into this law of liberty. Now, so this is sort of a, a preamble, and I used it like for 35 minutes to go into something. So I'm going to have to continue this, this sermon further because there's a lot to this to this sermon. Um, so what is the problem that Paul presents when he talks about in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? What is what is the problem? What's, what's the problem here? So let's just look at this more detail. We have this glory that's shining from Moses' face, and the people want Moses to put a veil over his face. So the problem is that this veil represents something. What does it represent according to Paul? Right. So their minds were blinded. But why are their minds blinded? Their minds are blinded because of our sins, right? So because of our sin, can we behold Christ? Can we behold God? Well, we also have a misapprehension of God's character. But because of our sins, we can't approach that light. We can't look at it. We hide from it. So our minds are blinded. Um, we're unwilling to look upon that which can save us. Now, if I do not know God, and God was to reveal his glory to me, what would happen? Uh, can be consumed. We would be consumed, right? So... So God can't just reveal himself in all of his glory to humanity. If he did, we would die. We would be burned up. Right? And he's going to do that at some time in the future. And those who have not had their characters transformed, who have not learned to love God, they will be burned up. But all of us start with a misapprehension of God's character. We can't behold God's character. Um, now, Paul presents a solution, right? He says we have to turn to the Lord, right? In verse 16, nevertheless, when it, that is, um, we could say maybe it's probably uh the mind turns to the Lord. The veil shall be taken away. And when that veil is taken away, we can behold the glory of the Lord. We can look into this glass, in, in this revelation of Christ, see the glory of the Lord, and we can be changed into the same image from glory to glory. If we have that glory, if we have that character of God, we will be able to face God when he reveals his glory. But we have to now do it gradually, right? It is, we can only take so much of God's glory. And God has veiled his glory and he has unveiled his glory as well. So in his word is hidden Christ's character. It's there for us to see. But it's it's veiled so that we can take a bit at a time. But he wants to change us into that image. And so through the gospel, God is allowing us to progress from being in darkness and coming to his marvelous light. Now we know that um, God's glory is going to lighten the whole earth. I'm going to read uh, a few spirit of prophecy statements here dealing with that. Uh, but we know it also from uh, many passages in scripture, of course, which Ellen White is going uh, to refer to. But um, what's the primary verse that we first look to when we talk about um, the glory enlightening the earth? Revelation 18. Okay. So, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Right? 
So we know that this is going to happen. In a sense, we're in the process of that happening. But this is uh, God's character being revealed. And it's first going to be revealed through his people. Before Christ comes back, his people have to reflect his glory. And, you know, when we talk about um, Revelation 18, we know it's connected to Revelation 14. And Revelation 14 is going to have, and that's what this study is really about, it's about the three angels' messages. Right? It's about these messages that are going to uh, reveal God's glory to the, to the earth. So these, this is the everlasting gospel, as we know. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Right. So we know from the Friday night studies, we're studying it, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we know that um, the third angel's message is not just the gospel on its own, that all three messages are needed, just like all three decrees are needed to begin the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. All three messages are needed. You can't have a third without a first and second. And so this everlasting gospel is something that God uses, a three-step testing prophetic message all throughout history in bringing a person from, from darkness, from Babylon, from Egyptian bondage, however, whatever illustration you want to, to use in scripture, to bring us from that to him, to his kingdom, to the land of promise. So whether it's on a national level or a personal level, we all experience a progression, three angels' messages, three steps, a message that comes to us. Now, in the studies that we, we're doing on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith, uh, we actually, at the beginning, began with two illustrations of Ellen White's uh, from early writings dealing with the first and second angels' messages. Uh, these illustrations were illustrating uh, in sort of a visual way this light coming and shining upon the earth and people responding and people rejecting that light, illustrating the first and second angels' messages. Um, but we're going to look at those in more detail as we move through this study, which we won't get through today. Um, but I'm going to read these statements here, so I'm going to switch my screen so you can see these. This is from Life, Life Sketches uh, 327. Um, you can see the 327, March 27th, symbol of 273, the message to the Levites. Uh, you will need to make straight paths for your feet, lest the lame be turned out of the way. We are surrounded by the lame and halting in the faith, and you are to help them. Not by halting yourselves, but by standing like men who have been tried and proven, in principle firm as a rock. I know that the work must be done for the people, or many will not be prepared to receive the light of the angel sent down from heaven to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Do not think that you will be found as vessels unto honor in the time of the latter reign to receive the glory of God. If you are lifting up your souls unto vanity, speaking perverse things in secret, cherishing roots of bitterness. So we can see how this relates to Dwight's study. The frown of God will certainly be upon every soul who cherishes these roots of dissension and possess a spirit so unlike the spirit of Christ. So we need to be uh, prepared to receive the light of the angel sent down from heaven. So when we get to this revelation of God's character, um, we have to be able to receive that light. And that means we need all of these messages. We can't just jump into the third angel's message. Right? The third angel's message is going to lighten the earth with his glory, as it says in the next quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 429. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third message. So that's the second angel's message, right? 
that's the other angel of Revelation 18, is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here brought to view. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. So we know that's from August 11, 1840 to October 22, 1844, 1,533 days. And um, Ellen White in other places compares this to uh, the Exodus, which in, occurred in 1533 BC. So it's kind of interesting. The first message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in this country, there was the greatest religious interest, which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third message. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, hasten from place to place to proclaim the warning from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the message will be given. Miracles are wrought, the sick are healed, and signs and wonders follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth are brought to take their stand. So everybody's going to be brought to this test to make their stand. And this is at the time of this manifestation of the power of God. The third message, lightening, lightening the whole earth with his glory, the glory of Christ. <clears throat> It is to the thirsting soul that the fountain of living waters is open. God declares, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. To souls that are earnestly seeking for light and that accept with gladness every ray of divine illumination from his holy word, to such alone light will be given. It is through these souls that God will reveal that light and power which will lighten the whole earth with his glory. So God is going to lighten the whole earth with his glory, glory through people, souls, earnestly seeking for light. And that light is going to reveal to them their sins, correct? Correct. That light is not going to flatter them and make them think that they're better than other people. It's not going to make them critical. It's not going to make them become gossips, slanderers, right? Accusers. Yeah, accusers, right? It's going to be something that's going to cause them to seek to reconcile all to God. It's Christ's character. It's the work of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation that has been given to us by Christ. Those people will reveal that light and power, which will lighten the whole earth with his glory. Not people who are not willing to see their sins. And so we are not willing to see our sins. That's our nature. We want to hide from the light. And we can't do anything about anyone else, but we can do something about ourselves. We can, we can receive what God is showing us about ourselves and confess it and ask him to work in us. While praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast high, cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed upon fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon, some grew weary 
and said the city was a great way off, and they expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm. And from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Hallelujah. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark, wicked world below. One thing we can't do do is deny the light behind us. If we come to the point where we say God was not leading us, we would be fulfilling this prophecy, right? That there is not where we say that God was not leading us. That is the doubt. That is rash. We need to examine the past and understand uh, our history. We need to know that God was leading us. And if God was not leading us, you know, as individuals, we need to recognize our sin and confess our sin. It would have a change upon our lives because maybe as individuals, we weren't following God. But God has his movement. And if we deny this movement, if we say that somewhere along the line, this movement just completely went off course, let's say from 2013 onward, um, that there's no example of that in Millerite history. We would have to look to some other history. We would have to have been in rebellion the whole time. We can't then pick up and say, well, we were following along the path a certain way. We fell off, and now we're going to go back onto it. That doesn't happen with God's movements. They do have times in which they go through trial and test. They do have tarrying times. The Israelites had to tarry in the wilderness for 40 years. Right? So tarrying does occur. But God is still leading all through that because he's leading the Israelites through the wilderness for those 40 years. He was leading them at the beginning. He leads them at the end. <clears throat> of course, we're familiar with this quote from Christ Object Lessons 127. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message to the people of to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. So if we think about this idea of light, there is light that God brings us. If God brings us the light of the ministry of righteousness, if we behold the characters of Christ, does this make the Old Testament law, uh, does it, is it what gives glory to the Ten Commandments? If the Ten Commandments are written and engraven in our hearts, does that give glory to God's character, to his law? Because they're no longer written and engraven on stones. They're now written and engraven upon the fleshy tables of the heart. So this light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth glorifies the old. Does the new covenant glorify what occurs under the old covenant? Yes. 
I would mm-hmm. say yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. We can now see, because of the cross, the value of what God did in the past. We can see the purposes of the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary. Without the cross, all it is is paganism. If you understand what I mean. It's man trying to meet God's standard, trying to atone for himself. The way that the Jews came to understand the sacrifices wasn't really any different uh, than their neighbors. They were doing these offerings to appease an angry God. But with the cross, we can see that God himself offers himself as this offering. Because of his love, that he's not seeking to harm us, but seeking to save us. That's what the Jews should have seen in the law, not just in the law of the sacrifices, but also in the Ten Commandments themselves. That God was showing them his character. And the contrast between his character and theirs. So when the people said all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient, right? Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do in that's uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 8, I believe. Um, When they said that, they entered into a covenant based upon their promises to keep God's law. But the new covenant is based upon better promises. God swears by himself. With two immutable witnesses. Because God cannot lie. And he promises what he's going to do in our lives. So what we're going to see next week in the sermon next week. And and, and we'll see how far we go. Because there, there might be some other things happening in that sermon. Uh, a testimony being given. Um, but we'll see how that unfolds next week. But we're going to look through uh, the role of the first and second angels messages. In, in understanding their role in the proclamation of the third message, the loud cry. So, any comments that people would like to make before I close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Sabbath, for the time that we have had here, uh, opening your word, And we ask, Lord, that your character can be revealed to us, that you can undo that foundation that we have laid in our hearts of doubt and unbelief. Help us to recognize your love and its power to change us. Help us to approach you um, with this knowledge that that veil can be taken away. Help us to understand that our promises are just ropes of sand. But you have given us a rock to stand upon. Please be with each person. Be with the different countries and families represented. Not just here in the study live, but all who watch these videos. We pray, Lord, that you can speak to them. That your Holy Spirit can reveal Christ. We ask, Lord, that we can reveal Christ to those around us by dependence upon you and not ourselves. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.